Literally. Let's go to Psalm 101. What kind of a segue was that, right? What's that? No, I don't make the kids drink it. Oh, man. That is a hilarious visual. I'm just imagining how each child would respond respectively. Everly would just immediately break into tears. Um, Leighton would just immediate rage, knock the tablespoon thing out of my hand and question my common sense. Um, I probably wouldn't do it to Lily yet. But anyway... uh, Maybe one day I'll make them. All right. Well, Psalm 101 is a fascinating text. It is one of the few wisdom psalms in the Psalter. Uh, Wisdom psalms are the smallest of, is the smallest of the Psalter genres. Um, And uh, so every once in a while when you come across one, it it almost feels like you you accidentally, you know, are in Proverbs, Um, but this is a wisdom psalm of presumably David, you know, depending on how seriously we take the superscripts. I take the superscripts pretty seriously. I think that they are, I think there's good history for them. Um, I think they've been maintained well. So when I say superscripts, you understand, I mean the title, so a psalm of David there. Um, So I think it's it's rational to think that David wrote this. uh, there are lots of recurring themes that, that we see here, but it is a practical psalm. It's a very helpful psalm. Um, and what he's going to do here is he's going to elevate a, a, a specific concept as um, bringing an element of security in our life. Okay, so how do we have security in life? Notice I didn't say safety. How do we have security in life? Because I think those things are different. I think we tend to think of security or certainty as synonymous with safety. And we all want safety. I want safety. I want safety for myself and for my family and you know, all those things. Um, but security is actually, and certainty, when we think of terms like that, it's actually more, sh- more sure than safety. Because we understand that danger is inherent, inherent to a fallen world. Whereas security and certainty are Biblical reality is assured to us by God. And in this text, David is going to, he's going to connect the concept of godly character as, as being synonymous with security or certainty. And so I'm going to give you an image, and we're going to kind of use this image throughout the, the study this evening. Um, and I'm going to, so if you want to think about it this way, David is building for us like a, a castle of character. So a, a castle obviously intended to, to maintain security and, and, and to keep what's dangerous out, what's spiritually dangerous and circumstantially dangerous out, and what is spiritually safe and secure in. And so he's going to build for us this castle of character that if we live inside this castle, we are more likely to have a secure life. Because you understand that within God's sovereignty, yes, or God, God ordains everything, but you understand this, the basic reality that living according to God's law is his will. Therefore, it is safer as opposed to living outside of God's, when I say law, I mean scriptures. Um, I don't necessarily mean like, you know, don't think Jewish law, we have to live according to that. Living according to God's truth, we need to use that term. If we live outside of that, it brings consequences. Therefore, it is unsafe, which is why I'm, I've said this, I mean, probably 20 times. When I talk about obedience with my children, I, I, I use the term safe. They know that obedience is right and obedience is safe. Because consequences are dangerous. Um, and so those are ideas I want them to understand inherent to obedience. So Paul, Paul David's going to give us this castle of character. And if we live inside of it, we're more likely to be secure because we're not bringing consequences of life down upon us. So having that in mind, let's pray. and We'll begin to work through Psalm 101 together. Father, we thank you for the reality that if we live godly, 
we have certainty. You've given us everything that we need that pertains to our life and our godliness, and you've given it to us in a more sure word of prophecy that is in the scriptures. And so I pray that you would help us understand them tonight. Give us um, eyes that are opened by your spirit to behold wondrous things out of your law. And I ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. Let's read the short psalm together. I will sing of the steadfast love and justice. To you, O Lord, I will make music. I will ponder the way that is blameless. O, when will you come to me? I will walk with integrity of heart within my house. I will not set before my eyes anything that is worthless. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not cling to me. A perverse heart shall be far from me. I will know nothing of evil. Whoever slanders his neighbor secretly, I will destroy. Whoever has a haughty look and an arrogant heart, I will not endure. I will look with favor on the faithful in the land, that they may dwell with me. He who walks in the way that is blameless shall minister to me. No one who practices deceit shall dwell in my house. No one who utters lies shall continue before my eyes. Morning by morning, I will destroy all the wicked in the land, cutting off all the evildoers from the city of the Lord. So the psalmist begins as you would think that a psalmist would. Praise and singing and music. And then the psalm takes a very uh, noticeable turn from Outward, outward expression of worship to very inward, pensive meditation. And, and expressions of praise to expressions of personal commitment and vowing before the Lord. So as we build this castle of character together so that we can live a certain life, he begins with the foundation of this castle. The structure of this psalm is is very interesting. It, it, begins, um, it begins with you know, a, a, a section of four verses, um, and there's, there's really no repeated refrain. Um, and then there's just kind of some standalone concepts, which is, which is actually characteristic of um, wisdom psalms. If they were hymn psalms, psalms intended to be sung or celebration songs um, or ascent psalms or things like this, you would expect there to be a little more tight, expect it to be tidier with the, the verse divisions and paragraphs and strophes, and there would be a, a refrain. But he begins with some concepts before he gets very specifically into what's outside the, the castle, so to speak. And so let's look at the foundation of this castle together. He begins with praise. I will sing of the steadfast, I will sing of steadfast love and justice. To you, O Lord, I will make music. Remember when you think of steadfast love, and even when you think of justice in the Old Testament, namely the Psalms, you can immediately think of God's covenant-keeping keeping love, the reality that God keeps His promises. This is who Yahweh is. He keeps His covenant. And why does He keep it as co His covenant? Because he, he loves steadfastly. And justice, He will accomplish what He's doing according to his, he's accomplished what he intends, what is right, according to his will. And he will work his justice in relation to his covenant. He will keep his people safe. He'll protect the people. He will bless the people. And he will work righteousness and justice against those who threaten the people. This is the covenant. So he begins with praise, which is... To, in a certain extent, it's where you have to begin when we, when we think about um, a system of security, or to use our term, when, when we start this castle, when we begin to build this castle, the, the very first foundation really does have to be acknowledging who God is, and fundamentally that's what praise is. It begins with acknowledging who God is. Um, our, our praise is, and you've heard me say things like this a thousand times, our, our praise is proportionate to our understanding. So we have to begin with a right view. Otherwise, we'll end up with wrong worship or limited worship. 
or shortchanged worship or even impure worship. So the psalmist begins by looking up and he begins in a place of worship. And if we're going to truly have godly character, which brings us certainty in life and security in life, we have to look up. We have to have a right view of God. And when we have a right view of God, we'll, we'll worship Him. And our praise will be pure, and our praise will be rightly proportioned to our understanding of Him. If we look out for security rather than up, then we'll, we'll turn to naturally insecure remedies what's out there, as opposed to what's in him. And what's out there is maybe information, or the news, or money, or relationships, or we attempt to control our circumstances, and all those things are uncertain. But if we begin by looking up, a right view of God, and then a right response to that right view is worship. This is the first and necessary foundation to building a security that lasts. So he begins by looking up, and then he begins to look in. I will ponder the way that is blameless. I will consider, I will meditate upon the way that is blameless. No obvious accusation or sincere or pure I will consider, I will meditate on what is right and who I should become. So he begins with praise and then he turns to pondering. He thinks the right way. The security of our life, the certainty of our life flows from the stability of a biblically mature mind. If we think the wrong things, we'll end up in the wrong place every time. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. I will ponder the way that is right, it's pure. Do we think on things that are pure and honest and just and true and lovely and of good report? If you're just to inventory the meditations of your mind, are they, are they pure? Are they guided by purity? Are they guided by righteousness? Are they guided by truth? They're constricted by what you know of God? I ponder the way that is blameless. I really do think, and, and this is not just because, you know, there tends to be personality types, and we all need, we really do need personality types for, um, you know, just to help us get along and to push each other outside our comfort zones and all these things. And I think one of the unhelpful kind of dichotomies is the, you know, there's the rational and the expressive people. I think in an extreme case, that's true. You know, some people are more thoughtful and some people are more emotive. And anything is, that, that can be true. Um, I, think, I think you can be both. I think sometimes we draw a very distinct line. In fact, I think maturing believers are both. I think maturing believers are both thinking people and emotive people. Because thinking people really feel rightly. Do you understand what I'm saying? People who are grounded in the word feel the right things. And so we're constantly growing in our maturity so that we feel what we believe before we believe what we feel. And there's a huge difference between those things. But in order to feel rightly, we have to think rightly, we have to ponder rightly. And if we think guided by what we feel, that is one of the fastest ways to end up living a life of selfishness and fear. Because our hearts are deceitful and desperately wicked above all things. And when the world tells you that fundamentally your heart's okay, 
and you just got a few things you need to get straightened out. Christians, they, they accidentally buy stuff like that. You know, you're, you're, you're okay, you're doing fine, and, and you just need God to help you be better. That's not, that's not the dispositions of the Scriptures. I am not fine apart from Christ. I could do the worst thing. I mean, I could be Hitler apart from Christ. I could be an add in whoever apart from Christ. I'm not fine. I need to be better. I am a mess. And I need God to constantly clean me up by the blood of His Son and the redemptive work through sanctification. That's who we are. And what begins to happen when we grow in our maturity is God grows a whole person. Alistair Begg says God doesn't grow lopsided Christians. That's a great way to say that. He grows a whole person. In other words, he grows our, our, our mental faculty, how we process, and he grows our emotions, and it actually begins to change even sometimes how we live our life physically because we think of our life in more disciplined categories. God grows a whole person. And I got to tell you, one of the things I see more than, one of the primary problems, this is like a top three primary problem, if I was to say this is the issue in the American church, one of the top three problems is that people believe their feelings more than they believe the scriptures. And we're all, we can all fall into this trap. Whether it's, whether it's something so minor, it's something so minor, minor, I mean, as, you know, I, I know I need to be more disciplined in this decision not to eat that thing, but I think I'm really frustrated from work, and that would make me feel better. To, I think God wants me to be happy and I'm not happy with my spouse, so I'm going to leave him. And that, I mean, that happens in Christian homes constantly. And the justification is always, well, God wants me to be happy, right? I don't mean to oversimplify. I know there's a lot to all of those things, but if we believe our feelings will end up in the wrong place, if we believe in theology, God will correct our feelings. God grows whole Christians, so we have to ponder. We have to think. We have to believe rightly so that we feel rightly. Feel what we believe rather than believe what we feel. Then the psalmist turns to pleading, praising, pondering, and pleading. He asks for God's presence. Now again, we're building a foundation for a castle of security, a castle of character. And so I understand I have to begin with praise, acknowledging who God is, because if I look in, I realize there's insufficiency. There's just not enough. I have to think. I have to ponder what is right. I have to make sure my mind is where it should be. I'm, I'm safeguarding it. I'm thinking of what is pure. I'm thinking of what is right. And then I have to plead, God, where are you? Oh, when will you come to me? I need you. I do not need more of me. I am the problem. I need more of you. So come to me, Lord. Meet me here. Plea for the Lord's help. Plea for his presence. Plead that you would live in his presence. I mean, how often really in everything do we ask God for help? And I am so rebuked by this. I work for, I mean, we all work for God. But you know what I mean when I say this. I work for God, right? Okay, I know, we all do. But you know what I mean. Like I work, I, I like have clergy stuff, Right? You would not believe the amount of times 
and I'm very routine oriented, especially when it comes to preaching. Like I, and my, my process is like, you know, it has to be well-oiled machine, and if it's not, the world might end. I don't know, you know? And you would not believe the amount of times I go through my routine, and I am halfway through, fountain pen in hand, ripping apart a passage before I realized I haven't prayed. It's like, what is wrong with you, man? Like, you'd think you'd learn by now, right? <laughs> like, this is God's word, and I'm half an hour, I'm 45, an hour in, about to start through the languages, and I haven't said, open my eyes. I'm on my way to do a service that's the most important service in somebody's life or in the life of their family because they just lost their loved one. And I'm on the way there and I'm realizing I haven't prayed about it yet. And I need to cry out to, to God for his help. We just naturally do our thing, especially when we're good at it. It's just what I do. I've been doing it long enough. I can do it. I can do it. I can do it. I've got it. And we just do it. I mean, how much better might it be <laughs> if we asked the Lord for How much more joyful would, we, would it be while we were doing it? How much more freeing would that experience be if we were really doing it in the Lord's strength? I think, I think one of the primary accidental uh, mistakes that mature, mature professional Christians make is we just, we get in the bad habit of doing things for God without God. So tomorrow morning or tomorrow afternoon or tomorrow, whenever you spend time with the Lord, don't be like me and forget to ask for his help. Now the Lord's working on me and we're doing better, you know, doing a lot better than I used to. But, Especially in the things that are spiritual. I mean, in everything. But how crazy are we to think that we can do spiritual things without God's Spirit? It just shows the depth of our pride, how truly affected we are by the fall. And then the psalmist moves to personal commitments. And from here on out, in verse, the latter part of verse 2 um, and following, it's going to be a plea, it's going to be a psalm um, of vowing, okay? So we've got, we're building the foundation. We start with praise. We, go, we look up, we start pondering, we look in, we're pleading, we, we, we seek for God's help. And then there's the personal commitment. I begin to actually commit myself to the Lord. So you note, you note um, I will sing, I will ponder, I will walk, I will not set, I will hate the work, a perverse heart will be far from me. There's lots of vowing. There's lots of committing ourselves. Now, I want to be careful here, okay? I want to be really careful here because what I don't want to do is I don't want to accidentally preach law, that what we do after we've looked up and looked in and all that stuff, you need 10 principles to work harder as a Christian. That's not what I'm saying because you can buy those books at any Christian bookstore and they're really cheap and there's a reason they're really cheap, all right? Because they don't do anything for you. I mean, haven't you ever read one of those books and you got to the end and you felt worse about yourself, <laughs> right? You're like, I've tried these 10 things. Um, that's not what we're going for. But there, there, and we've talked about this in Ephesians 4 and 5, right? But there's a, there is a reality that if uh, I'm supposed to work out my salvation, I, I've got to do stuff. I'm not just going to passively hope that, you know, I get better as a person and not make any right choices, any right decisions, um, you know, revival is a big topic right now. Whether it's happening at Asbury, there's another big Christian school it's supposed to be happening at. I don't know. The, I don't know if it's happening or not. That's not what I'm speaking to, right? I'm just saying I think one of the, one of the problems with revivalism is that it, it funnels all of the pressure into the decision. In other words... God's worked in me, I feel all amped up, and I'm never, ever going to do this thing again in my entire life because I feel so good right now. 
And all of the pressure is in that decision. And we've attached all of our hopes to that decision. And what happens inevitably when we do that thing again? It causes us to doubt. It causes us to doubt. So, so be cautious. Jesus himself warns against vows. Okay? So be cautious, but we have to commit things. We have, we have to endeavor to do better. So there's going to be a lot of I will, I will, I, no more will I, or you know, things like this throughout the psalm. So let's just begin working uh, through these together. I will not set my eye, I will walk with integrity of heart. This is the, this is the primary, um, you know, this is even some of the heading. Uh, this word integrity is, is, literally has the idea of straightness or completeness, okay? So uh, uh, straightness, in other words, there's no, there's no varying, there's no wandering, and, it, it, and again, it has the connotation elsewhere, it's used in the, in the Old Testament for, for completeness, I will walk with integrity within my house. Notice the scope is actually small here. And he's going to talk about his house later. And in the very last verse of the psalm, the scope expands. But he's very concerned about integrity inside his house. You say, well, what does he mean by house? Presumably those closest to him. He might not only be referring to his family but those closest to him. Maybe kingdom, maybe we don't know exactly when David wrote this, but those closest to him. I will walk with integrity of heart within my house. I think, it's, and this is not, I don't want to make too much of this, but there is a very simple concept here. When we think about the scope, he uses the phrase again in verse seven. Um, no one who practices deceit shall dwell in my house. Um, there's a very simple concept here I think is worth noting. Um, it is very easy to look like you're living a life of integrity outside your house. Well, I'm going to say it's very easy. It's easier, and it's possible to look like you're living a life of integrity outside your house. But your family knows who you really are. They see the best and worst, and hopefully the best outweighs the worst. And the Lord's just working on us, right? But I think it's just a very simple concept here. You can, you can fake it in front of people. I mean, you can clean it up. You can wear the right clothes. You can say the right things. You can have the right phrases. And Jesus might just say about people like that, they're like whitewashed graves. Beautiful, well-made, cleaned up. But they're just full of dead people's bones on the inside. I will walk with integrity of heart within my house. I will not set before my eyes anything that is worthless. This word worthless literally has the idea of functionally useless. Actually, it's used multiple times in the Old Testament for someone who's completely out of their mind drunk. They're completely functionally useless. They add no value. They have no functional capability. And in other words, we have things in our life that are important. We seek after things that are important. I will not set my anything, my eyes, before, uh, I will not set before my eyes anything that is worthless. Not just bad, but actually unvaluable or useless. I hate the work of those who fall away. I hate the work of those who are falling away or living a life outside of straightness. Specific contrast. It shall not cling to me. This is an interesting phrase, but if you want to use our vernacular, it's like I'm not going to look over my shoulder at their work. Their work is not going to cling to me. It's not going to tempt me. A perverse heart shall be far from me. This word perverse has the idea of broken. You see it constantly in Proverbs. This word per perverse is broken or warped or bent. A perverse heart shall be far from me. I will know nothing of evil. So there's these personal commitments that he makes. The foundation of the castle is the most important part. And now he's going he's to talk about some dangers out there. 
So he builds this foundation of the castle. We start with praise, looking up, pondering. We, we look in, plea. We ask the Lord's help. Personal commitment. I realize that there's things in my life I need to do. And, and here's the things gonna, that are going to help me. Here's safeguards that are going to help me. This is a very practical psalm. Might be a, a great text for family devotions with teenagers or young people. So we've got the foundation of the castle. And then he's going to look out. He's going to look at some enemies or some foes of the castle. Some foes of the castle. Security, remember, security is inside, danger is outside the castle. Whoever slanders his neighbor secretly, I will destroy. Whoever has a haughty look and an arrogant heart, I will not endure. Remember, this is a warring society. David is a, a king, so obviously there's... Yeah, we haven't actually had a Psalm of David in a while. He, he uses some aggressive terminology, doesn't he? But um, you get the point. Whoever slanders his neighbor secretly, I will destroy. destroy. Whoever has a haughty heart... Haughty look and an arrogant heart I will not endure. Um, can anyone think of a poetic passage that sounds almost exactly like Proverbs 6? These things the Lord hates. What are the first ones? You remember? A proud look. A haughty spirit. What's the last one? Remember? He that sows. A false, the last two. A false witness and he that sows discord. I mean, it's like it's like David taught his son something. Interesting, isn't it? I mean, they sound exactly the same. Slanders his neighbor, haughty heart, haughty look, arrogant heart, I will not endure. So, so there's danger outside. What's the danger? Slanderers? Slanders specifically of his neighbor, not just of God. And and those that are consumed with themselves. A haughty look. You, you know what that looks like. Have you ever just seen someone and you think, oh, they like themselves? <laughs> you know? You know what a haughty look looks like. Uh, some people have it accidentally. I mean, they really do. Some people don't mean to. You know, face doesn't tell everything, but sometimes it does. And an arrogant heart. Um, C.S. Lewis says one of the reasons we're, we so often miss the needs around us is because we're looking up. And he's not talking about worshipfully. He means above people. It's in his chapter on pride and mere Christianity. We miss people around us because we're looking above them. And then verse 7 and 8, there's some other dangers as well. No one who practices deceit shall dwell in my house. Honesty is security. No one who utters lies shall continue before my eyes. Verse 8, morning by morning I will destroy all the wicked. This is the foolish in the land, cutting off all the evildoers from that. Now look, the scope has changed. It's not just the house anymore. Note that, it's the city of the Lord. So David actually, David actually moves from protection inside of his own house to protection in the city. Why? Because godliness is safety. So the foes of the castle. Now, you could be really specific. Listen, I'm assuming, and maybe I shouldn't, but I, I know you, most of you. I mean, Wednesday night crowd, right? Um, I'm assuming you have good friends and good influences, because I, I know most of you well enough to know that. Um, you have good friends, and I'm assuming you're not surrounding yourself with slanderers and proud. I mean, we're all proud, but you know what I mean. Those are characteristically horribly proud, consumed with themselves. I'm assuming you're not surrounding yourself with dishonest people and with the wicked. I think, if, I think if there's one of these that maybe the, the temptation would be to fall into, it maybe be the slanderers. Um, I really am thankful. I don't think we have this in our church, but I worked at a church one time, and one of the pastors had a phrase. He called them the foyer factions. And it was little groups in the foyer. And there was whispering until you walked by them. And then the whispering stopped. Gossips are hard to be around unless you are one. And then you think they're your friends.
Um, the New Testament has great warnings about slander in the concept of the ch- context of the church. So, maybe out of all of these, let's just especially be on guard for that one. Um, be on guard. Be aware of your kids' friends. You know, I think it's really easy to ask the big questions about influences in our kids. Well, are they, you know, do we think they're going to help our kids stay pure? You know, do, do they, you know, we, we don't look at externals too much, but externals tell something about the heart. And so choices tell something about the heart. You know, are they going to help our kids stay pure? Do they have good discipline, you know, lives? Do they seem to stay away from really destructive things? But what about, like, next step questions? Like, what do they say about their parents? What do they say about authority? Are they constantly complaining? Slanderous, slanderous friends are unsafe people. And so if we're building a, a castle of safety for even our, our, our children, um, I don't want friends who are grumblers and complainers. I don't. Um, I, don't, I don't want friends who constantly have issues with authority, whether it's their own parents or teachers or your authority in your house, because that says something about their hearts. I don't want friends who's... This, all right, so here's, here's one for you, okay? And I don't think this is law. I think my mom is really wise. My mom had a principle growing up. If my brother and I started liking a girl... She would get on their Facebook and she'd see how many pictures they had of just themselves. And I didn't understand it at the time. I was like, whatever, Mom. But that's really wise. And today, it doesn't need to be their Facebooks. It could be their Instagrams, but you, you just know. We live in such a self-absorbed world. But yeah, so it's really dangerous to have friends who, you know, very obviously cross lines, but what about the ones where they just, it's very obviously they're consumed with themselves. They're consumed with their bodies. They're consumed with other people's bodies or celebrities and their Instagram is, I mean, you, you get what I'm saying. So, and parents, as we're tasked to build a castle of safety around our, parents, around our kids, let's ask questions like this too, not just the obvious ones. Are they honest people? These are foes of the castle. They need to stay outside. They need to stay outside. So what about the friends? There's some friends in the castle too. Look at verse 6. I will look with favor on the faithful, the enduring, the obedient in the land, that they may dwell with me So not only am I keeping foes out, I'm intentional about having friends in the castle. He who walks in the way that is blameless, straight, shall minister to me. So there's the obvious aspect of I need to keep the foes out, but that's what a a castle is. It's a stronghold where I set up safety. And if God is building the the castle of of security and its godliness, this castle is godliness, then there will be people who are in the house and there will be people who are in the castle. It's people who actually add layers of defense. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Look, I love you and so... Since I love you, I just want you to know you came across this way and I don't think you meant to, but I think it was sinful and I think so-and-so might be discouraged. I called a friend one time. Just called him on the phone. I was best back in college, you know, when people still did talk on the phone five years ago. That was longer than that. Ten years ago. Um, and I just said, you are not right. He just started crying on the phone. 
The people that you really know, you know when something's not right. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. One of the things that Dean said a few weeks ago at the marriage conference, I think I want us to take really seriously as a church, and look, I know it's hard, and I've done it since. If something seems off in a friend's marriage, tap them on the shoulder. God may just use you to be a light and shine a light in a really dark, difficult situation. My friend Rand Hummel one time said they went out to eat with, they went out to get pizza with some friends. And while they were there, he or, his friend ordered the pizza and ordered it with green peppers. And his wife looked at him and said, I don't like green peppers. And she, he said, oh, you can pick them off. He said, the next day, I took him bike riding and I said, you're having an affair. And he said, how'd you know? There's signs. And there are other signs. But there's signs. So just be aware. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. They know, they, know this, how the, they know when to say the hard thing and they know when to say the soft thing. And they're, they're pointing the way. That they're, they're giving you straightness. They walk in a way that is blameless and they shall minister. These are our true friends and they add layers of defense to the castle. So this is a castle of security, a castle of godliness that is set up for, for us. A castle of character begins with a foundation of looking up and looking in and asking for God's help and then committing with God's help to do certain things. I wanted to share with you in church history, and I know we need to hurry, so I'm, I'm going to cut this short, but I wanted to share with you in church history Jonathan Edwards. He set up a castle of character for himself. From his, oh, I had to do this quick math, 1703 to 17. So from his age 20 to 21, he wrote almost 100 what he called resolutions. And these are some of them. These were his personal commitments. This is number one. So he would have wrote this when he was 19. Okay, Resolve that I will do whatsoever I think to be most to God's glory and my own good, profit and pleasure in the whole of my duration without any consideration of the time, whether now or never, so that many myriads of ages hence resolve to do whatever I think to be my duty and most good and advent, advent, advantageous for mankind. Resolve to do this, whatever difficulties I meet, with how many, how great, and whatever they may be. Number two, resolve to be continually endeavoring to find out some new invention and contrivance to promote the aforementioned things in resolution number one. Resolve that if I should ever, number three, fall or grow dull so as to neglect to keep any part of these resolutions to repent until I can come to myself again. Number four, resolve never to do any manner of thing, whether in soul or body, less or more, but what tends to the glory of God. Number five, listen, resolve never to lose one moment of time. Resolve to live with all my might while I yet live. Number six. Number seven, resolve never to do anything which I should be afraid to do if it were the last hour of my life. Resolve to act in all respects, both speaking and doing as if nobody had been so vile as I. And as if I had committed the same sins or had the same infirmities or failings as others and that I will let the knowledge of their failings promote nothing but shame in myself and prove only an occasion of my confessing my own sins and misery to God. Resolve to think much in all circumstances of my own dying and of the common circumstances which attend death. This is the tenth one. This is a 19-year-old. Resolved when I feel pain to think of the pains of martyrdom and those in hell. That's just ten of them. Personal commitments flowing out of a view of God. I 
as practical as how we think about others and how we spend our time. When we build a castle of character, it promotes certainty. So Psalm 101 provides very practical instruction to assure certainty in life flowing out of God's character. God's character assures life's certainty. So let's pray that God gives us strength to see who He is, to look up, to look in, to ask Him for His help, and to make true personal commitments that will assure the certainty of our life. Let's pray.